For those who've just joined us, um, I'm the curator of this exhibition. My name's Glenn Isika Pilkington. Um, I am of Noongar, Wadjuri and Nanda descent. Um, so I have a, a connection to both this country here, but also from the Murchison um, and the Gascoigne regions in the Midwest of um, Western Australia. Um, but I grew up in the Kimberley, so I'm a little bit confused when it comes to where I actually belong to. Um, look, I really don't know where to start. It's, it's been such an amazing weekend for me, having um, artists from all over the country converge on Perth and, and um, celebrate everything it is that they work so hard to achieve. All this um, amazing art and these amazing kind of interpretations of culture and reflections upon the different values. and. I think as you walk around the exhibition, you'll really get a sense of um, the diversity of Indigenous Australian art making at the moment. It very much provides a, a snapshot as to uh, the fact that we cannot pigeonhole um, Indigenous creative practice. There is no uh, way which is more Indigenous than any other. Um, every Indigenous person who makes material has the artistic license, um, their links to their heritage and to where they come from. Um, and I think you know those together combined to make uh, some really dynamic and exciting work and this exhibition is filled with that so um, spend some time after the talks, although they do go to three o'clock so you can just stay here with us. <laughs> um, I'm sitting here in front of Timothy Cook's work, I think I just wanted to move people around a little and so we're looking at different things as we're listening to, to what people are, are saying. I've only very recently um, come into <coughs> knowledge about Tiwi work. Um, it was always something, I don't know, as a young Aboriginal person, a curator of five years, I, um, you know, I still know that I've got a lot to learn and as much as we write about things and we uh, talk about things and we, you know, collect, make, build great collections of artwork, um, I don't think that anyone that I know thinks that they've stopped learning when it comes to Aboriginal Australian art and Torres Strait Islander art and I think that for me, I am just humbled to hear straight from artists about their experiences and uh, you know what informs their work and, and their histories and and having a good yarn and a laugh and all of those things which kind of really, to me, art is about people, it's about society and about humans and galleries give us a snapshot into, I guess, the legacies of, of artists and, um, but you know, artists are very much about uh, they're living people with great stories to tell and someone made a really nice comment yesterday about the fact that um, this, the work that we see on display is very much about a moment and this is kind of what's left behind after those moments have you know passed on and so you know Patrick's work over there you know it was about the moment he was making that work and we can appreciate it now and Patrick can appreciate it now and talk to us about it but that very moment when people are, are making works of art and painting um, and thinking about country and singing about country, that, that's um, really what this is all about and, and these are the reminders of that. Um, but as I was saying, you know, I, I, I didn't know much about Tiwi art, I'd always been very interested in it. I'd um, had the opportunity this year to go to the Tiwi Islands, which was um, amazing and I met with Timothy Cook and Raylene and Pedro Wanamiri and I was very starstruck within about three minutes I had the superstars of Tiwi art all kind of talking to me so um, it was an amazing experience and you know the plane over there left a little bit to be desired. Um, the, the flight over was fine, the flight back um, was interesting to say the least but if you ever have the chance to get across to Mitakapiti or to Bathurst um, I very much encourage it. I've never been to a place like that in the world. Um, it was like flying into some paradise which no one really sees or goes to, or it was just incredible. And there's a giant kind of um, strait between the islands that looks like a snake crawling, you know, through these islands. And and for me, in, in travelling to meet with these artists, I, I of course was trying to do as much preparation as I could, learning about the creation stories to do with um, Purukapali and uh, um, learning about Pukamani and Kulama ceremonies, and, and these are very much um, all depictions of the Kulama ceremony. So I wanted to have a little bit of information. Um, and as much as I, when I got to the island, I was talking with artists, I had no control over what that day was. You know, and that's the way into communities I, I go in and I just let the day be the day. And if artists want to take me somewhere and do something, then I'll do that. You know, I, I am there as a guest and a visitor, and um, I'm just very lucky that, uh, I don't know, 
when I got to the Tiwi Islands, it felt like that day went for about three weeks. There was just this timelessness to, um, to that experience. And, and I think that sense of timelessness and space and, and then this continuum um, is really reflected in the work that we see here by Timothy. Um, there is this never-endingness to Timothy's work. Um, the Kalama ceremony is a, a ceremony which um, uh, is really a rites of passage for young men. Um, it's one of two very important ceremonies, this being a rites of passage in the Kulama and um, the Pukamani being, I guess, the exit of our living life, um, the ceremony, the mortuary ceremony that happens. And if you, downstairs, you will see some commissioned Pukamani poles on display in Gallery 3 and 4, the uh, 1960 to 80 display. Um, so this is Kulama and downstairs you'll see Pukamani, although those poles were actually a commissioned set of work, so they weren't made for an actual mortuary ceremony, but more as objects for a museum. Um, but for those of you who had the chance to meet with Timothy, he's not yet here today, but he will be here later on, I believe. These works, for me, reflect Tiwi culture in such a, a stimulating way. Um, this amazing use of negative space, which you see in most of these works, creates this kind of astral dimension and, a, as I said, a timelessness and a never-endingness to these works. And I think the more time you spend looking at these works, which refer to a poison yam ceremony and the preparation of the kulama, the poison yam, for consumption, um, happens over a three-day period on, some, uh, on a hot fire. Um, and then the, the yam is eaten, but without this preparation and the ceremony surrounded to it, it would make you incredibly unwell. So, um, this gold circle that you'll see mostly in all of these works, even in this work which is quite different from the aesthetic that Tim um, usually works in, refers to uh, a certain time of the year towards the end of the wet season. Um, so for those of you up north, we don't, they don't have four seasons, it's just either sticky and raining or dry and kind of cool. <laughs> um, but at the end of the wet season, uh, this kind of gold ring come, forms around the moon. And looking back to um, those ancestral stories, um, Japara, who is the man who lives in the moon, who makes this gold circle and he's doing the Kalama and that lets the Tiwi know that it's time for them to do a Kalama ceremony. And it happens every year since those creation times. So there's Purukapali, who was one of the ancestral beings that, create, that was placed on the landscape by the, um, the mother creator. And then Bhima was his wife. And then you also have Japara is Purukapali's brother. And what happened was Bhima um, kind of had an indecent affair with Japara. And she left their son, Purukapali's only son, in a tree hanging in a, a dilly bag and came back after seeing Japara. And he had... Um, the, uh, sorry, Janani had died. Um, and so when Bhima went back to Purukapali, he was furious. He didn't, he he'd never felt such heartbreak. And so he, he declared to all of the Tiwi that um, from now on, uh, there will be death for the Tiwi. And it was the first time that death was seen on the island. And Purukapali took um, Janani's body and walked into the ocean. And that place is now a very sacred water hole. So, you know, there's a real level of depth to these works. But I think what's really exciting about Tim's work is that um, he approaches it with such a, an innovation and an and a ongoing aspiration to challenge himself and to make new marks and, and to, to kind of recreate and you know, retransform his aesthetic every time he's making work. And obviously the palette um, is very much signature to the Tiwi Islands, these, this new Savoka, similar to Kimberley Roka, um, and is collected from the islands. Um, some of the whites that he used are actually a clay more than an ochre as such, an earth pigment. Um, but, you know, they're very masterful works that I think embody Tiwi culture. And this um, kind of palette that we see reflects body painting, as it does a, a lot of indigenous material. Um, and so often the black is actually the skin of the Tiwi, and everything above it is a build-up of the paint that's been applied to the body. So um, that's, yeah, Tim's work in a nutshell and a bit about my experience visiting um, uh, the Tiwi Islands. And if you do get the chance to go, definitely go. It's, just an amazing, amazing place. Um, I guess what's come out from the last couple of days of discussion have been uh, the ideas of our history, and I'm always one for talking about our history. We have uh, a few different versions, A, B, C, D, E, and F, of our history, and uh, depending on 
well, your position as a person living in Australia and your kind of um, history and your upbringing and the values that have come to be a part of who you are. Um, you know, those histories are different. And for Aboriginal Australia, we have a history which is um, kind of entrenched in pain and agony and um, people being forced off their land and uh, murder and kind of, you know, there's a lot of negative things in our past. and, and um, People are coming to terms with that. I think a big part of coming to terms with this, this history is telling this history and, and making sure that these are things which aren't just you know, spoken or remembered, but there's a, there's a document about them. And I think that's a big part of, of the healing process. And my segue into this is looking at the work of um, Rico Rennie. Now, Rico, this is the work behind you for those um, who haven't had a good chance to have a look around. Rico's work is very much a contemporary take on um, his indigenous identity as an indigenous man living and working in a city. Um, and what's really interesting, I think, in this work, there's two works, but they kind of work as one. There's Recospective, which is the wall work, and then there's Remember Me, which is the humpy with the um, video work. But together they tell a very interesting story in regards to his identity. Um, you know, and, and from listening to him and having spent a lot of time talking with him, there's no reason for him to uh, to go back to a traditional way of, or a traditional aesthetic in his work. He knows who he is as a, as a black man living in a city and he knows the things that interest him and where he's come from and his history and working with spray paint and so on. And um, I just wanted to touch base on this work together because I think people often find it difficult to get a sense of what the dreaming is and it's talked about as if it's this kind of ancient lot of stories that happened oh so long ago and, and in fact um, you know an anthropologist called Stanner used the word every when to describe um, what the dreaming is and every when is now, yesterday, tomorrow, at this very moment in our past and in our future and this work Remember Me by Rico Rennie talks about that in a very contemporary way. He's remembering our past, he's remembering his present, he's remembering the future, his children, his ancestors. And this is very much a contemporary uh, representation of what that dreaming is and what it means to, to Aboriginal people around the country and how important it is. Um, obviously there's been a lot of things which have impacted um, people's own sense of cultural knowledge and understanding. Um, for example, I, I can speak a few different languages and bits thereof. Um, most of them are European. Um, my stories and my traditional knowledge that I have has been passed in English for three or four generations. Um, my grandmother has no language, um, she can speak bits of different languages, um, but the last person to have language in my family was my great-grandmother, um, Ginger Mary Ogilvy, and she spoke a, a Yamaji language, and looking back on my um, grandfather's side, which is Nyunga language, I think it's probably about the same distance back for comprehensive language, so, excuse me, so, um, you know, I don't have language, but I have stories, and, and I um, think a lot of people, um, you know, need, you know, I love being able to tell people about, you know, my experience and, and who I am as an Aboriginal man. I think Michael's work is really interesting as well. I had the pleasure of writing about Rico's work and Michael's work, as well as Patrick's work. And um, in travelling around the country, I had the first chance to meet with everyone and talk about the stories in, in their work and when we were selecting work for this exhibition. Um, and I was really captivated by um, Michael's work. I think there's a softness in the execution of, of all of those bodies of work. Uh, maybe not so much the softness in the Prime Minister series, through my eyes, but um, in Broken Dreams and Undiscovered, I think Michael approaches issues of serious gravitas with um, a really beautiful aesthetic. And I think that aesthetic, and I haven't listened to you this morning, may have come from something to do with liking fashion. You know, you, you have a real way of, of uh, resolving your image and, and the issues, um, as you've said, you like for people to, to kind of um, to read into it what they will. And, and obviously from a curatorial background, it's like a field day in there, you know, like there's so much to see and so many different symbols. In the same way with Danny Malore's work. And um, I just think for such a soft body of work, you're approaching some very difficult discussions about our colonial history. Um, you're approaching this idea of dreaming again, but in a, a very different sense, and, and looking at this, what, this kind of naivety of, of the first people to see white people here in Australia, and, and this kind of curiosity about, about their way of living. And, and I love that way of, 
you very softly and subtly using those symbols within the work. And, and I think that's the clever thing about Michael's work. That rope at the end, which we talked about, may be freedom. Um, you know, freedom in flight with this bird who in no possible way can actually lift that lady up off the ground. So there's an unreality to it, a disreality, and, and a really interesting take on, on what I think are some of the most important issues for um, uh, Aboriginal people in Australia, and, and, and they are telling our histories and, and linking back to where we've come from. And all of us as Aboriginal people have difficult pasts and we have legacies that, that live in our communities which are to do with that past. And I love the fact that we can come together as a group of people and, and look at all this beautiful material and celebrate Aboriginal culture and people together and have this experience. So um, the other person I wanted to talk about is Patrick. Um, Patrick's works are just amazing in the way they create this uncanny space. It's like you're just seeing like a, a little corner of that, what is a much bigger space. And I think for me, when I approach that work, I can see that whole wall of, of that country on there and the way that Patrick depicts it. It's expansive and it grows and it gets bigger the more you look into it. And what I love about Patrick's work is, you know, Patrick's the second time in the awards, I think, a couple of years ago he was in here. Um, and I think, for me, I think Patrick's work since then has um, really sort of gone off the page. Like, you know, the way that his hand is working when he's making those beautiful marks that depict Punalulu, you know, like I think there's a real delicacy in, in your approach. And, and for me, I love, I've always loved East Kimberley work. You know, I, um, as I said, I grew up in Kununurra and it wasn't even until when I, my mum worked for Family and Children's Services and I actually visited Dundun when I was really little and I'm, I've met a lot of people that I didn't know that I've met until recently. So, and I was this little whitehead terror, you know, running amok on all these communities that I'd be visiting with my mum. But Patrick's work, I think, not only is it, it's really masculine in some ways. I think, you know, he's a, a, a strong, cultured Gija man and you see that in all of the work that, that he makes. Um, and I love the fact that we've got a varied scale in his work as well because I don't think it really matters how big the actual canvas is. The way he paints the land um, really reflects the expanses of the East Kimberley. The East Kimberley is um, a really rugged country, you know, and you've got floodlands which go on forever, and, and driving through the East Kimberley, you know, you see these colours, all of these colours are reflected as the light changes, and, and you know, our eyes as humans perceive the reflection of light off rock and sand and trees, and the bark of trees can change colour completely across the day. And, and I think, you know, although they are very masculine words, there's a softness in there that reminds me of Hector's work. Like, I, I really see those soft pinks and, and that beautiful approach to colour and, and shifting of colour across the canvas. So, um, I feel really privileged to have you mob here today. So, thank you again. I, I, it was just so nice to hear you talking about your work, Patrick. So, thank you for that. Um, so I think, you know, we're probably running a, on time, I can talk forever, um, but if, you know, I, I've done this two years in a row and I've, I've travelled the country for ten weeks over two years and, and had these amazing experiences and for me to be able to bring people here to feel proud about their work is the highlight. There are many highlights, but this is what this is about, um, celebrating Aboriginal practice during people's lifetimes. <laughs> Um, and over the past few years, years, we've had a fair few finalists pass away. And um, I think for us as an institution to have the capacity to engage with people in their communities, visit them, develop a relationship with communities that will see us being friends as much as colleagues working together. And for me, um, you know, going to country, I grew up in country and now I live in the city and that grates against me a lot of the time. But I don't know if I could live without my iPhone and I don't know if I could live without my, all my lovely things and shops and stuff. But going back to country this year for me was um, one of the most transformative experiences of my life. I flew from Tiwi Islands after going to, to Broome to visit with Jan Billikan. I flew to um, the Tiwi and had that amazing day with Tim and Jillamara and Mop. And then I went to North East Arnhem Land. Um, and there was an old lady who has since passed away called Miss Gumana. Um, and there was a big ceremony happening at Yirikala. Um And as an Aboriginal person, I was not 
ask to be a spectator but to sit in on this whole experience. Um, and that lady's since passed away and for me, like to have been a part of that day was really um, amazing. I've never felt so connected to land and people before and, and I, I hope that you know I've held on to a bit of that because we come back to cities and it kind of all that relaxation disappears, you know. So one problem with going to Europe for holidays, by the time you get back, you're stressed again. <laughs> but, you know, um, yeah, so for me, I, it's just been amazing.